going to talk about uh, ethics, and le I don't want you to think what you're going to get is a Sunday school lesson. Maybe it is in a way, but a Sunday school lesson transformed through the mirror world into what's appropriate for who we have become as a result of the transforming technologies into which uh, so many of you have immersed yourselves for so long and therefore have been assimilated by them and changed into human beings who really we think in a different way. We don't just think differently, we have been rewired uh, according to the neuroscience studies, as well as our own intuitive insight into our experience, we have been rewired by the process. And the transaction itself changes us into something else. Now that we're adding uh, biologicals, um, I talked last year at DEF CON was on biohacking, because finally the material is cheap enough for young people to be able to get a hold of what you need to do synthetic biology, artificial life, and genetic engineering in collaboratory environments uh, and do significant work. It's kind of where it was in the early 80s, late 70s with hacking and computing. And that means because hacking and computing has brought us to this point, the knowledge and abilities will accelerate that much faster as everything does uh, as the information is shared. And as you download BioBricks, you don't have to do the modular work from the ground up anymore. Uh, kind of like becoming biological uh, script kiddies, creating your own cyborg. Right now it's cats and dogs that glow in the dark but soon it will be other kinds of things with more compelling sorts of uh, attention-getting uh, attributes. So we are changed by the process, and therefore ethics, which is really a very simple thing. It's uh, well, the best example I know of it came from a visit I made to the Zen Center in San Francisco. And uh, the, the Zen monk, I guess, came out and he bowed, and because you do what you do, everybody got up and bowed. And he said, you know why we bow here at the Zen Center? And because it was a Zen Center, people thought they had to sound spiritual and like D.T. Suzuki and make religious sounding statements. So people said, oh, we acknowledge the Godhead in one another and so on. And he said, good answer. He didn't put anyone down, being a good Zen monk. He just let the energy flow, Aikido-like, past him. He said, that's an interesting answer. That's an interesting response. And finally, when no one got it right, he said, no. He says, we bow here because, well, things pretty much work better when you bow. And that's what ethics is. What is it, the doing of which make things, makes things pretty much work better? And the absence of which makes things pretty much not work so well. Ethics is merely a way of defining possibilities of behavior that work not only for you, but for others as well. When I talked about social engineering at one of the early DEF CONs, it was about taking social engineering to the next level we all know what social engineering is. It is learning to present a persona that is sufficiently acceptable and credible so that people buy it, so that the information you are seeking can walk across the bridge you provide and you can apprehend something new that you didn't know before and technically the person giving the information didn't realize they were being taken uh, and that they were giving information to someone who shouldn't have it. Well, the next level is to do that, but to do it in such a way that it works for the person giving the information as well. That's simply the ethical response to social engineering as taking without creating a cycle of mutual energy exchange and information exchange. When you think about the universe and how it works, there really is nothing but energy and information. We know that matter and mass is merely energy that moves very, very, very slowly, which is why it can look like a particle or a wave, regardless of what it is. An object creates waves as well. And so everything does seem to be connected. So when we talk about ethics, we're really trying to just apprehend on a human level what the universe tells us is essentially so about how it itself, whatever it is, works, which is everything is connected to everything else. And therefore, if you are conscious, conscious, mindful, and vigilant, conscious, mindful, and vigilant, you will then adapt behaviors which, as best you can, pretty much work for others as well as yourself and then, uh, then the universe turns into a win-win kind of deal as much as it can. So I'm going to start by actually reading. Uh, this is a, just one little paragraph from a paper I wrote for the New, Par New S uh, Security Paradigms Workshop last year uh, in Squaw Valley. Uh, we had a panel, which had, uh, you might know, uh, Richard Ford or uh, Brian Snow or Steve Greenwald, uh, and we discussed ethics in relationship to security. And this was my take. The real possibility of social disintegration, which confronts us, if for no other reason from within as well as from without. Alfred North Whitehead said, the processes that 
revolutionize the society, all but wreck the society in which they emerge. Uh, so the dire possibility of social disintegration is uh, ever present, and especially present now, and in some countries uh, is felt more palpably than others because it is already happening. Elevates the moral responsibility of the security and, above all, intelligence community to a higher level. Linked in cooperative activity, in other words, spy versus spy. The only thing I disagree with about that take on uh, DEF CON, uh, the person talking to the Mohawk, uh, the guy with the Mohawk is the undercover agent, and the person talking to him doesn't know it. So we are wearing different uniforms. You cannot tell by the black t-shirt uh, who is who. I remember a guy from Air Force telling me that uh, you can spot hackers, they have blue hair and so on. And the hackers were writing notes saying, all right, if you want to look like a hacker, this is what you must do. And they're wearing Air Force uniforms uh, while they're doing it. So linked in cooperative activity, the intelligence operatives embedded in the world are responsible for maintaining social and global order. Now this is a de facto responsibility that has devolved onto them as a result of the transformational technologies about which I'm going to speak and also about the profound identity shift it has caused. And they're responsible for maintaining global order at a level understanding far beyond that formulated in the past by any one nation. In other words, if anyone knows things have changed, it's someone who upped into one of the agencies to do work on behalf of, say, a country like the United States or Canada or France, and then discovered that in practice it was very difficult because the boundaries around the country had completely dissolved as information flowed through them and they became at best semi-permeable, at most totally open borders, uh, that you could not know from whence cometh the information, to whom it is going, whether it's a false flag operation, what is the identity of the person, and above all, because now the data transmitted is modular, how it is going to be aggregated, synthesized, and then used on behalf of some other purpose for which you do not have a clue and cannot easily imagine. And therefore, the very foundation of intelligence work on behalf of a nation state is de facto compromised and undermined in the process of doing the work. And that's why those who are, again, I'll keep repeating it, mindful, Zen term, but it just means being conscious, having a clue, being clueful, being fully and completely aware of what it is that is actually happening to you, especially when it contradicts that which you have been taught to believe is true about yourself and your identity. So these communities of practitioners in the aggregate constitute a global community who share an ethos and modalities of operation not available to ordinary citizens because they are sanctioned by the states or non-state actors for which they work to break the laws in all of the other states and across the non-state borders uh, of all other countries. And therefore, the only countries whose laws they must not violate are their own. And it's a whole other conversation, but it's a real conversation inside the agencies, because now foreign and, and domestic being impossible distinctions to maintain, given the dissolution of boundaries, uh, it is impossible to do the work post 9-11, given what's been implemented, without simultaneously violating what used to be called, for example, the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution, Bill of Rights in the United States, which says unjustifiable search and seizure should not be carried out. There is no way to do search and seizure. There's no way to do observation. There's no way to do intrusive surveillance. There's no way to intercept massive amounts of data and then count on the filter or policy to eliminate that which you should not have. Because once it is gathered, it will be kept. And once it is kept, it will be observed. And as Dan Geer said, the only people who do not see that clearly are sleepwalking through the digital revolution. So therefore, these people share an ethos and modalities of operation not available to most of us, except, as I said, way back at DEF CON 4, when I first spoke there, except to real hackers, who have been appointed by the technology itself to do that which previously required the sanction of a nation state to do. In other words, very few people working together can now do what required enormous resources to do before because of pilfered, stolen, and shared information, as well as the smarts of the people doing it. Therefore, this cadre of people, which includes now not only intelligence operatives, but hackers, 
as a corollary, by definition, this cadre of people have a calling or an intrinsic vocation to maintain global order in a way consistent with the ethical norms and moral order articulated by our great cultural tradition. In other words, I'm not going to refer to any particular religion or philosophical tradition, but they all have an ethos, as um, Walter said in uh, The Big Lebowski, uh, learning nihilist, dude, whoa. He said, you know, talk about the Third Reich, at, at least they had an ethos, right? So all of our traditions have an ethos, and they are all transformed at the same time by these diverse technologies. I will try to say a little bit about that if I have time as well because our religious traditions were all formulated at the time that writing emerged in human consciousness as the great transformational engine of the technology of the word a couple, two, three thousand years ago. And then the printing press did it again. And now electronic communication, of which the internet is merely the latest iteration, is doing it once again. Each one of these recasts, reshapes our relationships to one another, and as I said, our identities. And therefore, these people, i.e. you guys and few, few gals who are here, uh, you people, uh, are transformed by these technologies in such a way that you must become vigilant, mindful, and conscious of what you are doing so that you recognize in practice that moral order and those ethical norms, even though they are violated all the time as a matter of practice, are the standard for a higher calling. What do I mean they're violated all the time? Well, people are sinful. You know, I used to be a minister, and uh, your, your benchmark was everybody, given the opportunity at the right time and the right behavioral background, will probably do it. Uh, and then you need a, mo a mode of reconstructing the person's integrity. Uh, we will break the rules all the time. So there are three pieces to this talk. Uh, each one could be, obviously, a whole talk, and I will try to keep each one 10 to 15 minutes the first talk is what happens to ethics when you treat it as if you are an individual. The second is what are, in fact, some of these transformational impacts of the technology so we can be more aware of what it is that happens out there where we operate. And the most important of all is the identity shift that is taking place, what that looks like, what that feels like, because the starting point to be an individual is not the ending point of where this technology is going to deliver us. Uh, for, for obvious reasons. The concept of an individual did not exist until just a few hundred years ago. It literally did not exist. The concept of an author did not exist. The concept of intellectual property as an objective intellectual artifact owned by a human with a boundary around it did not exist. And until the 18th and 19th centuries, nation states as the appropriate structure for the political, economic, and social transmission of energy and information did not exist because that level of integration and abstraction had not yet required, been required by the complexity of the flow. The flow of information, its velocity, and the amount of feedback into and outside the cyborgian system, uh, that actually determines where the boundaries are drawn to create an identity. Well, you can see, looking back, that those identities individual, intellectual property, rights, human rights, all of those things that we have been inculcated to believe are intrinsic to our humanity were, in fact, emergent properties of the technologies, which, relatively speaking, only so recently came into being and created these attributes for humans to hold to as if they were inviolable and universal uh, and always there. And that's what the digital revolution is doing to identity. But let's treat it as if you can be an expert, as if the assumptions we used to make are accurate, that an individual makes moral decisions, makes ethical decisions, and has the freedom to do it, and that you're an individual. That is, that the boundary around you is your skin, and maybe a little bit of electromagnetic energy, like an aura or Karelian photography shows, maybe a little bit outside that, but you're kind of defined as a humanoid. Uh, and, and that that's what you most essentially are. That was the assumption of prior ethical, philosophical, and religious systems. Well, when computing first developed expert systems, one of the obvious things to do was to create expert systems which codified the knowledge of real experts. And to do this, because expert systems worked by a set of if-then rules, if this, then that, which were governed by a series of logic gates, not, or, and, 
you know what those are, in a very basic way, that what was required was for knowledge engineers, i.e. Good, in, uh, good interviewers, to elicit the heuristics or rules of thumb by which people operate as experts. And so you would sit down with, say, a geological engineer who does prospecting for oil, and you would say, well, what do you look for? And as they began becoming conscious and articulating the rules of thumb or heuristics they had internalized as an expert, they would create a set of if this, then that rules, the dozens, hundreds, thousands, that would then be processed quickly so that a person who is not an expert could bring their queries to the expert system and ask it to tell them whether there was likely to be oil or whether this was diabetes or not, or in terms of ethics, whether this was or was not the right thing to do. So it was logical. You had rules. The rules were if this, then that. They were governed by logic gates. And the predictions of what kinds of domains in human experience they would govern, uh, as it happened, turned over time into vaporware. Because what we discovered was ethical considerations are not subject to if then rules nor are many domains of expertise that, in fact, uh, they escape if-then rules as a way of structuring them altogether. Because we learned there were like five stages of moving from a beginner to an expert. The first stage for beginners always requires rules. Rules are context-free, and they are relatively black and white. So you tell someone who is learning to do something for the first time, Think of programming. Always do this. Never violate that rule. Never break that rule. These are the things you must always do. And if someone has an inkling, but do I do it the same way here as I did over there? In other words, a context creates a different content. Forget that. Ignore the context. Just learn the rules. Learn how to speak the foreign language by the grammatical rules. And then, as you learn when I moved to Spain, having studied Spanish in high school, uh, you are speaking the equivalent of how art thou, gentlefolk, instead of saying, hey, man, what's, what's happening? Uh, you learned como esta usted, senor, not que tal. So you learned that by going by the rules, you could get by, but they're black and white, and they're for beginners. And that as you migrated through stages one, two, to three, which is a level of competence, acceptable competence, you began building up an internal database of experience inside yourself and relating the rules to that and starting to get an inkling that I can function pretty confidently on the basis of my experience. Well, a good expert system, even in these ambiguous and complex domains like human behavior, can take you that far to a level of competence which is doable. But it cannot take you to the final level of true expert. Why? Because when they talk to real experts, they discovered a couple of things. In all domains, Experts, number one, break the rules all the time. But experts know when to break the rules. In other words, they develop an intuitive understanding of their domain so completely and so thoroughly internalized that they know it looks like instinctively this is the right thing to do. And that meta rule, that kind of knowledge that transcends the rules, cannot be codified in a logical way. It might have a logic, a meta-logic, but it is not a logic that you can easily articulate, discover, and reframe in a computer program that enables others to just bring it. So if you were a nurse, for example, and you were told to diagnose someone to see if they're psychotic, you have your checklist. Do you do this? Do you, do you hear voices? Do you, um, you know, if you've done the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, many of you, uh, some of you have had to do that in order to get work. Uh, you feel psychotic just taking the exam, asking yourselves the questions in there in order to see, do you, you know, are you obsessed with the size of your feces, for example? I mean, these are things that don't occur to the normal man or woman in the course of daily life. But they did to the writer of that program because they had this database based on what people who were obsessed with that uh, turned out uh, to be like. So you can go down the checklist. But then I remember there was a nurse who did this kind of evaluation and had real experience she didn't use a checklist at all. And she said, and this sums it up, she said, I can smell psychosis. I can see it. I can feel it. I talked to somebody for two minutes. I can smell whether they're nuts or not, is what she said. And you develop that intuition. Now, you all have had that experience of talking to someone who 
might be a little marginal. Uh, and you start, to you start to sense it. You don't need to do a checklist. You don't need if this, then that rule. Where in ethics, what happens to this uh, is that it shifts the conversation entirely. Let me give you an example. When you're taught ethics, do the right thing, all religious systems have uh, some kind of doctrine or dogma or discipline that you are taught. Uh, catechism, if, uh, quest you know, question, answer. For every question, there is an answer. This is the answer. Uh, yes, ignore context, do this, do that. But as you grow in human life, moral life, ethical life, you discover there are many situations where that doesn't apply. And if you work for a large corporation, you discover that there are 99% of the situations to which you will be exposed or called upon to make a difficult decision. Because when you go into a corporate culture or any culture, you begin to be assimilated very quickly by that culture and turned into it, like the Borg. Uh, you just can't help it. Margaret Mead, great anthropologist, said, when I go into a new, new culture, uh, it takes me a whole year to learn again what I learned in the first week, because in that first week it was all new, and I could observe from my point of view what was going on in that culture and its different rules. But within a week, I was so assimilated by the fact of having conversations that it would take me a whole year to learn again as much as I learned in that first week. And when you're brought into a company or a culture or the government or some agency, you are immediately begun to be assimilated and taught what are the unwritten, unspoken rules that everybody knows in order to get along. So you learn how to be in that culture, and that immediately begins to compromise in a very primary way your free agency to act as if you are not, because everybody in a culture knows what works in that culture. Bruce Schneier said very obviously that when you give a lot of security rules to people, and they're cumbersome, and they interfere with the ease and facility with which they can do their work, uh, they learn very quickly what happens to you if you break them. Not much. Not much. But what happens if you break one of the inviolable rules by which the culture works uh, so that it makes less money? Uh, by, for example, spending a lot of time implementing security policies for which there are no consequences if you break them, as opposed to just getting the job done. Well, people learn very quickly. The job is to get the job done. The reward is to get the job done. As the story in The Onion, brilliant newspaper, said uh, once upon a time, customers are our second most important product uh, or uh, focus. The real focus, of course, is making money. Uh, whatever the net profit is to an agency, whether it's psychological gain or stopping a terror attack or whatever, will do whatever is necessary is the meta rule that scrubs all of those other rules. So once you are longer and longer and longer in that culture, you become it. And as you move up it, Timothy Leary said you never get the truth from a company memo. Uh, what he was saying is that by the time you become an articulate spokesman for the institution or organization, you have adopted its perspective as if you are it. You are assimilated, you are the Borg. As a consultant, we used to say our job was to jump into a pool of brine and cucumber the brine. But in a couple of weeks, you were pickled instead. Because what happened is, you go into the brine, the brine begins to impact you much more than you impact it, and you take a slot in that culture called change agent, where the secret agreement is change a little maybe, but not a lot. And then everybody is happy, and you can carry out your job and get paid to do it. So it's very difficult to move past the rules into a state of true expertise in the ethical domain. What does it look like? to do that. Well, I use Huckleberry Finn as a good example. You remember reading that or hearing the story or seeing the movie or whatever? Huckleberry Finn and a slave named Jim went down the Mississippi River on a raft. He helped Jim escape, which was illegal. And there came a time toward the end of the book where they had located him and they knew he had the slave, Jim, and that he should be returned, Jim should be returned to his, its rightful owner. Now, if Huck Finn went into a church anywhere around there, he would have heard from the pulpit the right thing to do is to return stolen property. Jim is stolen property, therefore you return him to the rightful owner. And if he had gone to a lawyer or a judge and said, what is the right thing to do? They would have said, the legal thing to do, the correct thing to do is return stolen property or else you are liable to felonious penalties as well for keeping stolen property and obstructing justice. My point is that he was faced with a dilemma in which the moral sanction, the religious sanction, 
and the legal sanction of his time told him the right thing to do was to return that slave. And the religious sanction added a penalty that if you don't do that, you are going to go to hell and be damned eternally. And in his day, you heard hellfire and damnation sermons all the time from the pulpit in the frontier environment in which he lived. And what did Huck Finn do? He sat down under a tree all night and puffed his pipe, and he thought about it, and he thought about it, and he thought about it, and with light of dawn, he came to his conclusion. He says, well, damn it, then I'll go to hell. I'll go to hell. In other words, the bond he had created with the slave Jim transformed Jim from a slave to a human being. His higher obligation to the human being was to keep him free, and therefore he risked, like any whistleblower does, extreme penalties, both from sanctions of the religious and social world, as well as legal penalties, and he leaped to do the right thing. Now, there's no way from the rules you could arrive at the right decision as he did. You had to jump to the meta rules. In other words, to be an expert at life requires that you know when to break the rules. So there really is only one real rule, and the rule is if you don't know when to break the rules, don't break the rules. Covers all cases. If you are a beginner, stick with the rules. If you don't know if you should break the rules, don't break the rules. But if you find yourself knowing that the right thing to do is to break the rules, and maybe if you're willing to accept the consequences for doing it, then you break the rules because you know you are doing the right thing and maintaining integrity at a higher meta level than that which informed your thinking in the first place. Real whistleblowers go through hell because the consequences are visited upon them with such fury as if to, one, punish them severely, but two, make clear to everyone else, you may win the lawsuits, but this is what we're going to do to you in the meantime. Uh, if you need an image of that, see the movie The Insider with uh, Russell Crowe. Terrific example of what is done to a whistleblower. Or if you do it uh, like the Pentagon Papers um, and you blow the whistle on an administration, an agency, you know what the greatest penalty is? Uh, this came from a friend who's, um, who, who knows the CIA territory very well. He said, you don't understand what a rush it is to be inside. Hackers understand this. Hacking is about getting inside, penetrating, getting information, cobbling it together and articulating it in a new way so you can see things you couldn't see before. For an insider in an agency to be part of the in-group, given that sanction, to know things that nobody else knows, and to be protected from lawsuits forever by virtue of doing what would otherwise be illegal activities, to be inside the window at the party in Georgetown where the buzz of the conversation among the classified guests is at this level and includes this level of disclosure because everyone has SCI compartmented information clarification or clearances at this level, to be part of that club is a better rush than money or sex or power. It, well, it is power. It's the power of knowing you're one of the insiders and you know. And the minute you blow the whistle or take the Huckleberry Finn route, you are out of the party. You are standing out in the cold with your nose on the glass, watching your former friends buzz inside the warm, well-lighted living room, the parlor in Georgetown, talking about not only the stuff you can't talk about anymore because your clearances are stripped, but also talking about you. And if someone catches a glimpse of you through the window, they look at you with such contempt and disdain because you are not a patriot, you are a traitor to them and to their way of life. I spell that out because I haven't found a way to leap into the meta-ethical domain in any way without consequences. When I was in the ministry, which I was for 16 years, I noticed that all of the things we used to call heresies were really subtle ways to get around having to be nailed to the cross. Uh, this is a way of saying, if you're doing the right thing, it's very hard, very hard to escape that consequence. But that's the cost of integrity. It's the cost of humanity. All right, that's looking at it from an individual point of view. Let's bring in some of those other things I mentioned and see if we can include them as well. First of all, mastery is not only knowing what to do intuitively and at the right time, like smelling psychosis, like I know what I need to do. I've got a knot in my stomach. They're telling me what to do, and that's not right. This is right. Mastery is not only knowing that, but knowing that you know it. 
The difference is anyone can stumble upon doing the right thing accidentally or from time to time. But if you know how to access the meta rules through your own mindfulness and vigilance of the bigger space, the larger mind space, then you know that you know and know that under any circumstances you have the resources within you to find, as it were, the reins if you drop them and pick them up and ride the horse again instead of being dragged by the horse with your head bumping on the curb. We can't yet use the biologicals I mentioned to inculcate values and new approaches to life, not quite. We still rely on social conditioning, and that means that the most important thing, if you want to be supported in learning how to do the right thing, is first of all, start with understanding what's happening to your identity, but the other thing is to build in a community of support of people who encourage you to do the right thing. Every organization that I have seen in my many days uh, has these three things, if it is functional. It has a lot of mutuality. In other words, you cannot do it alone. You are not a single do a monad floating through life individually. You are part of a mutuality, and you need to build in a structure of mutuality for the exchange of energy and, above all, information that supports your real contention and focus and intention in life. That means you need feedback. And organizations like people that function best build frequent feedback routes into and outside of the system, however you destruct describe the system. So do you see yourself as a cell with a border around the cell, cytoplasm? Or do you see yourself as a cell in a body, and therefore the higher good is to do that which serves the body? It should be both. But in those crunch times when the chips are down, are you going to do that which serves the body of which you are a part, even if it means another cell is going to replace you? And therefore the third thing, mutuality, feedback, and accountability you have to develop some kind of standard or structure to which you are accountable. And through feedback and mutuality, keep yourself accountable to it. Now, ethics does reference identity, as I said. And what is it that has happened to our identity? As I suggested in that passage I read at the beginning, identity has shifted rapidly, more rapidly than I thought, from individual identity formed by the Renaissance and the printing press and associate technologies which shaped human and cultural identity in a particular way, it has become a corporate identity. You work long enough on the internet, and I saw this happening to me in the 80s, way back when, you begin to think of yourself as a node in a network. And one of the things you discover is that power is exercised differently in a network than it is in a hierarchical structure. Now, there are still plenty of hierarchical structures, but they count on domination and control top-down as a way to maintain control. And that can create a rigid and inflexible structure. Call it silos, call it what you will. Every organization that builds this structure, as it seems they must, to organize higher level energies in a large, complex organization, discovers it builds in rigidity. Rigidity counts on fear to keep people in line. And it builds in a way of doing things that requires groupthink, that is, if you deviate from the norm, you do so uh, at your peril, even if you know you've got the right answer. And even though the right answer more and more is the answer that nobody is expecting. Uh, I'll take a quick side trip on that. Robert Galvin, great guy at Motorola, uh, was asked after 40 years of doing some significant breakthrough ideas, when Motorola was really a powerhouse, as uh, like Xerox used to be. Some of you have heard of Xerox or Kodak. Some of those companies had breakthrough ideas. Motorola had breakthrough ideas once upon a time. And Robert Galvin was asked what accounted for those breakthrough ideas. And he thought about it seriously and deeply. And he said, you know, every idea that turned out to be a breakthrough idea began its life as a minority opinion, often an opinion of one. And when it was said, it wasn't even heard. And then if it was said again and again, it was laughed at. And then if it was said more, it was scoffed at and rejected and denounced, and then the person was denounced who said it, and then finally it reached the final stage, in which not only did everyone say they had always agreed with that idea, but they agreed with it all along. It moves from the edge to the center, and one of the consequences of technologies of information that we manage and administer and build is that the edge moves to the center faster and faster. And Galvin answer, uh, added the corollary. He said, do you know, whenever we came into a meeting, 
and people quickly agreed on a particular course of action or strategic response to a problem, it was always wrong. It was always wrong. Now think about what he is saying. Link it to what I said about mutuality, feedback, and accountability, and the speed with which information moves into a system and transforms it. He is saying that people answer questions out of a knowledge base internalized from a context that used to exist. And because the future is arriving in the present faster and faster, and restructuring that context sometimes radically and completely, answers that come out of the context that existed up until yesterday may very well not be the right answers to the problem that faces us. And if everyone has been assimilated by a culture into thinking that way, those are the things they will all say. So as the general said somewhere sometime, if everyone is saying the same thing, then somebody isn't thinking. So new information coming into the system faster and faster through feedback loops and the mutuality that enables information to be shared in complex ways changes the context and therefore the first person to see the difference and articulate it will sound like an idiot. They will literally sound crazy. And ethics is often crazy wisdom. It's saying what's appropriate for a new emergent context that didn't exist until 10 minutes ago. But I see it now. I'll give you one example from my own life. Uh, I used to be in the ministry. I was in the ministry for 16 years in the Episcopal Church. And I was asked to be part of a leadership pioneer group called New Paradigms for Clergy Leadership because they knew things were coming down. They knew things were changing and being transformed socially and intellectually through the information revolution, but didn't have a handle on why yet. So the response was, let's do what we've always done, which is choose some of the smarter people and get together for 10 days and listen to talks and presentations from Silicon Valley people on changing paradigms, and then we'll change the paradigm. And I was sitting there in the second year of this three-year project listening to these other guys all of whom were older and smart and wise and had big parishes or were bishops or whatever, you know, whatever the hierarchy looks like, you can imagine it, it looks like that. And they're talking about ways we can change the paradigm. And I suddenly had one of those epiphanies, which once you know it, you can't unknow it. And I said, I just realized what we'll have to do to change the paradigm. And they said, well, what? And I said, we all have to leave. That's how quiet it got. For about six or ten, I mean, it's quiet now, right? The gears are clanking. The answer is not leave. The answer is change this, change that. But changing this or that, when you are an instantiation of the old paradigm or model or way of thinking, is exactly the problem. The fact that you reward yourself with leadership positions means, like any church structure, like my friend a cop says, hey, my church... Uh, the police, same thing. You're a rookie. You're put in dicey situations. We observe how you work. Uh, you say who's taking vice money. You say who's taking cocaine. Uh, the word goes around real quickly. He can't be trusted. You become a company player. You play the game. You are elevated through the structure that rewards you for confirming the culture and its real values, not its articulated values. And as you know from headlines everywhere, a church, too, can get in a lot of trouble having that kind of culture. It's the human condition that creates this situation, not any particular way of thinking about things. So to change the paradigm when you're part of the paradigm literally means something radically new. The processes that change our societies, when they emerge in those societies, all but wreck those societies, as, as I said. But as McLuhan said also, as long as we are willing to be conscious, nothing is impossible. As long as we are willing to contemplate what is happening, be mindful and vigilant, we include more and more information in our own structures in order to speak appropriately to the context that exists. So you know what the digital revolution, so-called, has done to things. Boundaries around countries, literally, while they're still there, they're still functional units in a way, the more closely cooperative those countries are with one another, the more transnational or metanational structures have come to emerge. A transnational is one that has a headquarters somewhere but works globally. A metanational, it has no headquarters here or there. It is floating in the clouds like the Sky City in Lando Calrissian. It is not anchored to a particular national identity. 
it has a beholden identity to its own management structure, and that's it. It doesn't belong to a country anymore, and that is why things happen globally and financially now, as you know when you think about it, that are not in the interest of the country to which the person doing the things they're doing says they belong as a responsible citizen, because in fact they have been created loyal to a different structure altogether. So what I said in the beginning about the intelligence community is that de facto, when you're in the trenches, and you're exchanging information with someone who says they're an Israeli, and you've got information, because after 9-11, I've heard people who were at those meetings describe the silence in the room, like the silence we just had, when the executive order came in, and the president said, this is the way we're doing things now. And the silence was so thick, because the paradigm was changing. The paradigm had been, the Constitution does not allow us to do X, Y, and Z. The new paradigm was, we must do X, Y, and Z. The technologies enable and compel us to do it, and therefore we will do it. And then when people get alarmed, you have someone running for president who says, I'll change that. But as soon as they're in the Oval Office and get the daily briefing and see what we can do and see what we need to do and see what the consequences are if we don't do it, then you keep doing it and do it even more. So a friend at CIA said to me the other day, uh, I can't sleep at night reading the FISA intercepts and reading about what people are trying to do to us. When you live at that level of urgency or anxiety, then you are willing to do almost anything to protect what you believe is in your own self-interest, that is, those you love, that is, those with whom you culturally and socially identify. And as I said, that is exactly what is being changed. So we are loyal to other structures. Is that nine minutes? I'm at 45? Yeah, hey, you're right. It's very good. OK. Um, uh, think of a company you work for, a, a wonderful book uh, by Max Berry, an Aussie, uh, Jennifer Government. Uh, Jennifer Government. Well, the book presumed that you were loyal to the organizational structure that had assimilated to you beyond any national structure. And Aussie could see it more. There are only 20 million Aussies, but you had to pay attention to China, United States, Europe, and so on. You have to pay attention when you're not a North American, a Canadian, or an American to the impact of the closing boundaries and then the shattering boundaries around you in a different way. So he could write this straight up. It was his experience. There were people in that book like Jennifer Government or Bob Microsoft. And what this was was simply an acknowledgment that if you work for the government or work for Microsoft or work for CIA, then you are, in fact, owned soul, body, and heart by the organization that has assimilated you to the degree that you have become an articulate spokesperson on behalf of its values and ways of behaving. And you not only articulate them, above all, you do them. And if you don't do them, then you suffer, as I said, those whistleblower consequences. We can't help this. McLuhan said, first we build the tools, then they build us. We are transformed by the technological shapes of our interaction with one another, and we can't help it. And power is redistributed. I talked about it moving from the edge to the center. How is power exercised in a network if it's not hierarchical and domination and control? Well, people who work in a network discover the way to articulate power is by influence, by participating and contributing. It's a very different skill set than learning to do it top down. Now, has one replaced the other? No. No new technology replaces another technology. It recontextualizes it. It changes how it's used. We still have plenty of books. We also have iPad and iPhone, and people are reading more and more electronically, and they're reading differently. And what I'm saying is, on the basis of the studies that they're doing now, they're thinking differently. The most recent one that came out, which has been verified for me by uh, professors who tell me this is true, this is something really to think about. More and more, our students, they said, can take a long paragraph and tell you what each sentence means. But if you ask them to give you a paraphrase of the paragraph, they can't do it. In other words, the modular construction of meaning through the way they are being rewired by their interaction with digital technologies is changing what they think is a meaningful modular construction of meaning, a meme. And it's shorter and shorter and smaller and smaller. And therefore, the very capability to think abstractly and to get to the big picture and to transcend and to meta-think and do the things which I'm saying the new world requires you to do if you're going to be mindful and conscious 
and choose to do from time to time when the chips are down the right thing. Because life is not brought to you on a tray in the morning like a breakfast. It's fired at you every morning, point blank, from the barrel of a gun. And how you respond is how you have taught yourself deeply in those communities of formation to respond. A friend of mine who studied karate and studied it and studied it was coming out of a movie theater one night. And it was dark, and he was turning a corner to go down the street to his car, and he felt a hand come out of the darkness and grab him by the shoulder. He had studied karate so well, he did not think of doing anything else. Turned, broke the neck of the assailant. Except it wasn't an assailant. It turned out to be a friend who was trying to stop and say, Rob, I haven't seen you. How are you? Instead, he wound up with a broken neck. What did my friend learn from that? He said, make sure that what you are studying is what you want to do. Because when you don't have time to think, what you will do is what you have been practicing. And that is why mutuality, frequent feedback loops into and out of the system, and accountability to some kind of higher standard compel you to examine mindfully and with forethought what is it you want to do when you won't have time to think and the chips are down in your work or in relationship to your organizational structure. I had someone at a bank say the other day, we spend 60% of our time doing internal politics. It's like a, a leviathan, like a whale. The larger an organization gets, the more it requires energy inside the belly just to maintain its equilibrium so it doesn't cook itself to death. So more and more energy, feedback loops inside the system must be devoted to a transfer of maintaining equilibrium energy so that the animal can float and swim and eat. And then the rest is dedicated to the task, which if they were asked what it does, that would be empowered to do. So all I'm really encouraging you to do is take into account that this transformational process through which we are still going and which is now going to move more and more into biology, uh, take it seriously and think about it. Give yourself time and opportunity to think about what it is you're doing. Look at it and consider what it is you're doing in relationship to the whole at the same time, as I said, those philosophical, cultural, national structures by which we have identified ourselves are also going through the looking glass. No one said it would be easy. Well, this is not trivial stuff. How do I know what is real? Someone said. Uh, Philip K. Dick came up with one of the best answers to that. Reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, refuses to go away. It's that which persists in our lives and keeps knocking on our door no matter what. And how do we deal with it best? We deal with it best by building in, as I suggested, when I said leave the paradigm. I did leave the paradigm. I am, in the work I've done for 17 years, an instantiation of a new paradigm, but it meant taking a hit on the pension because it meant turning down the jobs that were coming my way that I thought I always wanted to do, that I realized with cognitive dissonance and growing dis-ease, unease, was not congruent with who I had be become. And therefore, I had to make the choice for the next phase of my life, which luckily turned into 17 years of speaking and writing, uh, to do something else. But my beloved wife is back here. She can tell you at the break what the first six months of that were like, because you have to build a new persona, restructure it to be credible and congruent with the cultural conditions created by the new technologies, and articulate what is going on with sufficient meaning and intelligibility uh, to, to make sense to people. This, OK. Um, yeah, we're almost there. So I have to say something about mind games. Normally, I would say you can buy Islands in the Clickstream for $10 now, which is cheap. Uh, my wonderful, brilliant insights into technology where it's taking us. Uh, and then while that's true, I have a couple of those always, this just came out. It's a collection of fiction, and it's called Mind Games. Uh, why did I start writing fiction again after years of not? Because about seven or eight years ago, a friend of mine at the National Security Agency said, you know, you can't ever talk from the platform about the things we talk about or write about it uh, unless you start writing fiction. Uh, and he's followed it up by the profound statement, the only way you can tell the truth is through fiction. And another NSA friend said, yes, because let me tell you what we'll do to you if you make one mistake. And then he did. And it makes you think seriously. Uh, as a friend, again at NSA, who does deception, says, illusion, misdirection, and ridicule. 
These are the hallmarks of deception programs. Illusion, create them. Misdirection, look over here. And ridicule, when something is in plain sight and everyone can see it, so ridicule the person and destroy their reputation for credibility that he said the greatest of these is ridicule. Uh, it always works. It always works. And we have so many resources. One of the stories, Break Memory, on the compartmentalization of memory, in here uh, addresses that. Uh, the introduction, the first story, quotes a guy from NSA who read Zero Day Roswell, which I wrote about the quote Roswell incident. And he called up and he was laughing and he said, you know, this is hilarious stuff. He said, it reminds me of the Robert Redford movie, Three Days of the Condor, where he played a CIA agent who read fiction to find out what was true. He said, do you know 95% of your story is true? And I said, I know that. He said, and do you know that in order to know which parts are true, you have to know which 95%? In other words, in order to have the public key to the code, you have to know what 5% is false. And his bet was that most people would think the false parts were true and the true parts were false. Buy the book, read the story, evaluate it for yourself. So I start writing fiction. I published about three dozen stories, and I'm working on a novel now, which is going to be even better. And Mind Games is about alternate realities. Uh, the quotes are mostly from uh, people in the agencies who found it true to their multiplicity of realities and personas because once you cross over the line, as a friend said, once you're into the Hall of Mirrors, uh, you know what's not true, but you don't know what is true. It creates a chronic state of anxiety appropriate paranoia, and many of you who work in security and intelligence live in that state all the time. What is the antidote to that anxiety and appropriate paranoia? Mutuality, feedback, and accountability. Building alternative functional networks of people who know what the hell you're talking about when you do speeches like this. So that when you talk to each other, it's kind of a tag team match spread all over the globe in which you say, yes, you're not crazy. You sound crazy. Most of the people out there who hear you think you're crazy, but I know that wisdom and insanity are contextual. And you then make a case for having moved into a context in which what you're saying does not sound crazy. Like, what I am doing right this minute, the context is you creating me, speaking, and you listening, and a transaction happening. So my behavior is sane in this context. You come back here at midnight, the room is empty and dark, and I'm still up here doing this, you will say, I am at best a little marginal, right? The context changes, the content changes. Wisdom and insanity are contextual. Every great truth began its life as blasphemy. You have to change the paradigm by stepping out of the paradigm, and there is a moment of free fall, a zone of annihilation through which you walk, in which everything you thought was true is called into question and is called unbelievable by your own mind. And before it reconstructs itself, you have what the Zen Buddhists call a nightmare in daylight. You see the illusion. You see maya. You see the veil rip. You take the red pill. Use whatever metaphor you want to use, but it is what is now required, especially of intelligence and security practitioners, simply to be on the road toward learning more or less some of the time how to kind of do the right thing. Because things pretty much work better most of the time when we bow to each other, when we respect one another, and when we build alternative structures of community and humanity, because the old ones are not dying but dead. But as we know, human beings can take a lot of bullets and keep walking before they finally fall over. The paradigms persist. But when you talk to people, a uh, good friend who does this work lived in East Berlin, he said, you know, up until the day the wall came down, none of us really thought, literally, could think that the wall might come down. We knew how bad it was. We knew this was true, that was true. But you learned to live with it. And until the wall came down, it never occurred to anyone that the wall would come down. But if you were mindful and vigilant, you knew 10 years earlier that one day the wall is going to come down. And that Reagan saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, was merely instantiating what he already knew had economically and socially taken place because despite appearances to the contrary, he was paying some attention some of the time. And so that is the task we have. It will sound crazy, uh, but it isn't crazy. And things turn out to be true, which will challenge you. I have a whole set that I'm not going to say because I don't have time of eight instances people have shared with me 
doing counterintelligence or finding out what was true. I'm going to just share quickie, real quickie, and then we'll be done. Uh, someone was working for one of the stock exchanges in New York, and he was charged to do security work to build perimeter defense, and they wanted uh, perimeter detection. But he said, I can build it stronger than that. I can stop some of these things that are happening. Intrusions are happening all the time, as you know. And they said, no, you're doing a great job. He said, but my job is to secure the enterprise. And they said, no, your job is to build intrusion detection, not intrusion prevention. We found out the reason was because the hacking that was taking place was done by people on the board of the stock exchange who were coming into their own system to get inside information. So you can imagine his face and the plaintive wail in his voice when he said, what's the right thing to do? That's the kind of situation that confronts you. Blowback happens all the time. A guy who was on a counterintelligence mission in Haiti, he thought his mission was to stop cocaine flowing through that particular island. He got down there, and there was a revolution of some sort, as there is all the time, always chaotic. And they were really worried they wouldn't be able to do the mission. Many he heard that a crony, a close friend of the president's, was coming down, this is the former president. And, and he was relieved because he thought, ah, he's going to shore up the mission. No, he wanted to make sure that the channels stayed open so that the cocaine could continue to move to the place, the terminal in um, a town called Mena. I don't remember, Arkansas. Uh, so, so from there, they could go other places. Uh, he said, what was my job? Who am I working for? In moments like that, the boundaries dissolve, the loyalties are called into question, and you are confronted with, I thought this was the right thing, but maybe the right thing is this, but my gosh, if I do that, then this. And those are the moments I'm talking about that you may get in small ways or in big ways. And nobody knows in advance how they're going to act in such a moment. But you know in such a moment who you are by observing what it is you have practiced doing so that it becomes, in fact, without thinking, what it is in such a moment that you do. OK? So that's my charge. Add that subtext to your conversations. Buy my book. It's only 20 bucks. It's an incredible amount of insight, wisdom, and beauty. You cannot buy 20 bucks worth of beauty, insight, and wisdom comparable to this anywhere in the world. That's a true statement. There's nothing quite like it. I can say that. Uh, and I have maybe a dozen with me. And if you want one signed, I'll be glad to sell it to you. I have to do this. The publisher publishes, and then he says, thank you. <laughs> You're on your own. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for your intransitive concentration. Thank you for being here and for the last 17 years of my life, thanking you for forming the community of mutuality, feedback, and accountability that has kept me as honest as a former pastor can be kept. Thank you. <laughs>